Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Relationship with God series. The topic is Understanding Your Emotional Self Presented by Jesus and Mary Magdalene on the 9th of February 2014 in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia. This is Session 2, Part 2. G'day. So let's uh, move on to the next bit, which is about emotions and proper understanding, the proper of, emotions. understanding of emotions. So what we've just covered was we, we've ti- entitled Emotions and the Way. So that's where we looked at the two parts involved in that, right? And this now the section we're now looking at is, uh, what is it called again, Ben? Uh, proper understanding of emotion. Yeah. Proper understanding of emotions. Now, given all the information we've already shared with you over yesterday and part of today now, if you don't have the right way of seeing emotion, what would you do? You think so? What have we if listed? If you're in it? error around emotions. If you're in error around emotions, what would you do? So, sorry. So you'd cease the emotion. That's true. You'd try to control it. Right. But how does that then affect you? Sorry, you're not clear about the question? The cease control emotion. Well, you, you would try to get rid of the emotion altogether or you'd try to control it. You would try to do one or the other. This is if you're in error around emotion. If emotions. you're in error around emotion. You're trying to either get rid of the emotion altogether or control its expression. Right? And yesterday we talked about some of the ways that when we do that, we come to view emotion. Can anyone remember how we... What we talked about then? How do we come to view emotion when we try to control emotion or we try to get rid of emotion? How do we come to view emotion? We view it as painful, yes. Painful, a weakness. Keep going. We judge it. And what do we do in relation to ourselves, Paul? Right. With judgment. Yeah. Can we use the mic because we're losing a lot of stuff here? Uh, we try to shut the emotion down. Yes, so we try to control it. But, but what are we doing in this place? We're, we're really saying, aren't we, that the emotion and preventing it becomes the highest priority in our life. In some ways, we're like investing in it so much, aren't we? Can you see that? And we remember yesterday we used the term investment in emotion. But by, by seeing the emotion as the thing we have to control, we then begin to invest in the control of the emotion. Does that make sense? So our focus becomes all of our actions are all invested in control. controlling or deleting this emotion out of our life. Avoid, deny. Does that make sense? And, and it's actually the opposite thing we need to do. See, if, if we allowed the emotion to flow, we would stop thinking that every emotion is going to be a terrible experience. But because we're trying to stop the emotion from flowing, we think that every emotion is a terrible experience. Can you see that? It's, it's like, you, you know, we can talk about emotion for five years and there's a few things that you probably have never realised about emotion and that is every time you think your emotion is more important than anything else, you're investing in it and preventing its flow. Susan, if we go to Susan. If we go to Susan. I still don't feel we've got that yet today in this discussion, right? I I was just feeling that I sometimes make it wrong as well. Well, of course you're going to, because, yeah. because, you, because there's all sorts of investments we will eventually place in it. Like, as soon as we have any kind of investment in the emotion itself, and we start putting the emotion above the rest of our life, and more correctly, we put the prevention of the emotion above the rest of our life. 
Now, surely, like if you, if you had $1,000 in the bank and you invested it on the stock market, you would probably grab the whole $1,000 and put it on the stock market. Right? But if you invested the $1,000 on your soul, you'd probably grab the whole $1,000 and put it in helping you to grow emotionally. Now, imagine if you got the whole $1,000 and put it on the stock market. Just one thing has to happen... And what's happened to your whole life? Bang, it's just gone like that. All of your money's gone. Uh, and if it happened to be money that you needed for living, you're now in a disaster. You're now bankrupt uh, through that one action. This is what we do with our emotions. We're investing in our emotions so much that we put all our emotions or the prevention of all our emotions in one basket. And then, of course, when, we're, when we do that and we're successful doing that or, or it fails either way, we are so tied up with the investment of that that we will fight everything else in order to make that happen. Imagine yeah. if your, your sole purpose was not to feel anything, nothing. All I'd have to do is come up and go like this, and what would you be willing to do? Be yeah. Even in perhaps In extreme nervous. circumstances, you might deck me or shoot me. And there's people on the planet who do that. You go up and you've just got to push them like that, and they'll turn around and... Floor you. You just got to look at some people and they'll floor you. Yeah, that's how much rage they have in them about protecting some emotions. Huh? And this is the trouble with trying to control emotion. The control itself becomes our investment. So we do anything to control. Right. So we're not actually. We're, uh, so in a way, the emotion, or or we could say again the desire to not feel it becomes the most important thing in our lives. And this happens every day to you. Every day. Every day there's emotions inside of you that become the most important emotions in that moment that you want to deny. And you'll do all sorts of things in that place. You'll sometimes have sex with people who you don't really want to have sex with. You, you'll sometimes you know, feel murderous feelings towards other people. You'll sometimes go and do something unloving because of an emotion that you didn't want to feel. And it comes up, bang, bang. Every day there's different emotions inside of us that we are so invested in preventing that they rule our lives. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, yeah. If we bring the mic down. Um, what I'm not understanding is um, you said that the emotion becomes the investment. Does that also go to, like, just say fear is your investment or the emotion of fear... You, you, what do we need to do it. with our emotions, Fab? Feel them. Feel them. So to feel them, we're going to have to see them in some way. What are we going to have to see them as? As, a, as, an, emo as an emotion. As just, just an emotion. An emotion. Now, when we see something as just an emotion, what are we seeing it as? Something that's doable, something we can accept, something we can feel and allow, something that can flow, that we don't have an investment in staying on top of. But if we made fear or whatever emotion as not just an emotion but as everything, we will never feel it. Well, not only will we never feel it, it will now control the rest of our lives in our attempt to avoid it. Mm. Now, bear in mind that we're talking about any emotion here, whether it's what you classify as good, and remember our definition of good from yesterday is often flawed, and then what you classify as bad, which also is often flawed <laughs> as well. Any emotion we're talking about, if you do not allow the feeling of it and see the way you're going to allow the feeling of it is by seeing it as just a feeling, just an emotion, just something that, you, that will pass through you and leave you. right? And if you don't see it as that, can you see you're not going to want to feel it? And if you don't want to feel it, it's not going to pass through you and leave you, and it's going to dictate the rest of your life, which it does. And this is what I'm saying. And that doing the opposite to that is investing in the emotion rather than just seeing it as just a feeling that will pass through me. And another, there goes another feeling. And we don't go, there goes. We actually feel it passing through us. So it's an, it, we feel the emotion. We don't do the new age thing and go, Oh, look at that other emotion, you know, that kind of stuff. We don't do that. We do the thing of feeling the emotion pass through us. So, so if it's tears, sadness, you might cry. 
If it's shame, you'll feel ashamed. If it's fear, you'll feel terrified. If it's whatever the emotion is, you'll feel it. But if you see it as just an emotion, rather than seeing it as something that is a terrible, terrible thing, or a terrible, terribly good thing, it's just an emotion in either regard, does that make sense? Then you'll feel it. Is that okay with good emotions as well? Of course. So, for example, if you've got this excitement yeah. and you hold that, because you don't want to let that go. Well, then no. You're invested in just. Well, you control it. Controlling you're, it. You're trying to control it. As soon as you try to control it, you've invested in it. Now, when no longer you feel excitement, you feel disappointed, you feel terrible. Mm. Or when somebody doesn't go along with your excitement, you feel terrible and disappointed, or you feel upset or angry. Right? But if you feel the emotion and let it pass through you and let it express itself how you wish to express it, you don't feel any of those things. Yeah. Yep. So, is. Um, judgment control? Of course. But it's a control that's been enforced by your environment generally. So in other words, your judgment of emotion usually comes from somebody else teaching you to judge that emotion. The way you control your emotions a lot is by judgment. That's how your parents controlled your emotions. They said, no, that's really bad. I'm going to be belting for that. That's really good. You can do that. And the good thing might have been not so good from God's perspective, and the bad thing might have been good from God's perspective, but, but you now judge each one based on what your parent taught you. Does that make sense? A lot of us have that, if I put everyone else's feelings first, then I'm good. If I put myself first, now I judge myself. Mm-hmm. When actually, when we honour our emotions, we have to honour ourselves first in order to feel them. Yeah, so eventually you will not be selfish with your emotions, though. Yeah, you won't be self before others. Does that make sense? But you need to honour your own emotion, otherwise you won't even feel when you're selfish. <laughs> and many of us do selfish things every day and we don't even know we're being selfish because, because of the judgments we have and the fact that we don't want to feel certain emotions. Yeah? Should we go back to Catherine? What about an, um, an error emotion? Same applies, Catherine. Like, so if we're fear, let's say it's fear. It's just an emotion. Um... I've been crying most of the morning about yeah. everything being my fault. And, um, yeah. and it's just about, and I know that it's not all my fault, but it's just about if people don't mind me mentioning. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, um, I was talking to Philippa and... Um, and she asked me whether I'd been invited to this. Yep. And I said yes. Yep. And, um, and I thought about it. And instead of ringing her back and saying, why don't you ring up and find out why yep. you haven't been invited. Yeah, which might be just an innocent overlo- oversight, but go on. Yep. <laughs> so I rang Susan up. Yep. So why did you do that, Catherine? I... Why? Because um, I felt um, it was probably unfair. Why? That she hadn't been invited. Right. So you felt it was I unfair. I felt it wasn't. Mm, yep. I felt I've got a feeling that um, it's unloving that everyone can't come and listen to it. Somehow. Well, see, that is out of harmony with love, though, isn't it? Yeah. Because sometimes, what if people who wanted to come wanted to just come here to to attack me and Mary? Like, that's right. Is that okay? No. Because we're giving a gift that's not okay. No. Right. So. No. I, so that's an un, un, untruth as well. What I'm saying is, your action to to do something about Philippa calling you was driven by an emotion in you that's out of harmony with love. Yes. So you need to feel about that. But Philippa calling you in the first place and discussing it with you, when she knows the number of all of the Nitchin's family, is her act of love uh, un- that's unloving. She involved you in a situation that needed to be uh, her. Well, she didn't decision. ask me to ring or anything like that. That was no, that, but that you was don't my... see where you go with this. Philippa's motivation, and if Philippa is honest with herself about her motivation, she could have called the Nitchin's family immediately. She had all their numbers. Yes. Instead, she calls you. Why? I don't really know, but I just... Well, should we I ask Philippa? <laughs> why? Uh, I can feel why, 
But Philippa needs to feel why. So let's ask Philippa, why do you think that happened? I think I, I said to Catherine yesterday it was very unfair of me to, um, to bring it up with Catherine because I was... Yeah, you know that now, but let's just forget all that. Yeah. So stop all the judgment. <laughs> yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, all of you need to stop all the judgment. This is just a situation that occurred. Let's look at the motivations. Like, forget the judgment, because the judgment's not helpful. Right? Let's look at the feeling you had at the time. What was the feeling you had? Rejection, I guess. That you didn't yeah. want to feel. Yeah. Otherwise, you would have felt it and not picked up the phone, hey? Okay. Yeah. And so then I was justifying not picking up the phone because I knew that I then had that feeling... And then that's why I didn't pick up the phone. But you picked up the phone and rang ring, someone else. Yeah, to ring Sue or uh, Eloise or... Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. let's look at, firstly, yeah. the rejection feeling was the fe feeling that you felt right at the start. Yeah. You didn't choose to feel it. Correct, yeah. Correct? Yeah. So what, what, what then caused you to ring Catherine? So you felt rejected, that's fine, and you didn't, feel to, you didn't choose to feel it, that's fine too. You, you, you know, you're allowed to do these things because yeah. you have free will. But what caused you to involve someone else in the process now of your rejection? Probably because um, I wanted to feel better. Well, what, what do you feel about Catherine? What do I feel about her? Mm. Mm. I think she's beautiful. You do, but keep going. Do you feel she's... Maybe, maybe like a mother figure. Okay, someone who's going to agree with you and maybe feel the same way about your rejection. Yeah, and probably make me feel better about myself. And yeah. So and also you know that Catherine knows the family still. Yeah. So you know that somehow this information is probably going to get back to the Lynchens family. Yeah, I, I, I didn't consider it, but yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yes. And, and, so, and so if that's the case, then you knew that there was also this roundabout method to actually air a complaint without actually having to do it with the Nitschen's family. Yeah. Which is what your choice was to do, was to involve Catherine in your complaint. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So rather than judging that, Philippa, again, you're trying to get back into the judgment there and you don't need to... You've got to go like, okay, what was I avoiding? What was I avoiding? I was avoiding just ringing up the Lytton Hitchens family and finding out that, yes, they had rejected me. Yes. And you might have found they hadn't if you'd rung. Yeah. Right? And you might have found instead that all they thought was you, you weren't around or, you know, that you were somewhere else or who knows. They might have even just forgotten you from the list for some inadvertent reason. You see what I mean? There might be a simple explanation for it. Yeah. But the emotion in you decided the real fear, truth was rejection. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was the, the truth for me, that I wasn't wanted yet. Yeah. And then you made another decision to involve... Another. Yeah. We, many, we do this all the time, right? If we're honest with ourselves. Like, you have a problem with me, but you can't say it to me, so you say it to Mary. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a common thing. You know, it's very common. You'd be surprised how many people come, people come up to Mary and say, um, would you be able to tell AJ, blah, 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 you know, like, <laughs> and Mary goes, go and tell him yourself. <laughs> right? We involve another. Why do we involve another? Firstly, because the real reason why we've involved another is because we chose to not feel the original feeling. That's one reason. And there's a second reason why we involve another. We're usually looking for commiseration of some kind. Right? And we want to involve another without any consideration about what involving them in the situation means to them and how much pain they might then have to endure as a result. So now, now this triggers... It's great law of attraction because it triggers... Catherine and her feelings, oh, this is unfair, what's going on here? And then it triggers another feeling that she has, which is another stronger feeling sometimes that she has, I'm responsible for things going bad for people, I've got to fix this. And that then causes her to go and take the action that you could have taken in the beginning, um, but didn't. Now, all of, any, all of this involves emotion. All of this happens because of the emotion. And we need to understand that every time we suppress the emotion, right, try to control it, we now honour that emotion over everything else. 
It's now become our God that, that we bow down to and do everything that it dictates. Does that make sense? That's how, we, that's how we need to see this. We start seeing, in your case, in this case, rejection became your overwhelming concern. Instead of just feeling it and letting it pass through you, after you'd done that, you probably would have rang up Peter and Eloise and said, hey, you guys, I heard you're having a thing Saturday. Am I, can I come? And they go, probably, yeah. <laughs> you don't know whether they might have done that or not because, because the feeling of rejection was already in play and it became your God. And for Catherine, the feeling that she's responsible became in play rather than just feeling that and feeling about how she feels responsible for anybody who's you know, being treated unfairly and just having a good feel about that, she's now preferring to feel punishing of herself for, for a different reason. And that's because of honouring one motion over the other as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And then when you ring up Sue, she feels all guilty. And what does Sue <laughs> right? do? So what does Sue do? You don't feel your guilt? I, di I didn't feel my guilt and I didn't feel the fear of not being um, approved of by... So what did you do instead? So I just <laughs> went headlong into ringing you and... Exactly. Okay. And, and, I'm, yeah. and I'm going to see. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. Whose place is this? I can't remember whose place it is now. Is it mine now? Yeah. I all of a sudden inherited yeah. a 17,000 acre property. Isn't this wonderful? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all my responsibility. Yeah, I just... I, I didn't feel anything. I just went into panic. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you didn't allow yourself to feel the guilt feeling and the feeling that someone would disapprove of you or see you as bad when you hadn't really done a bad thing. And, yeah. and so you didn't want to feel that. Yeah. And so what you want to do is put that on someone else and <laughs> say, you know, onto someone else. So now, can you see how everything becomes so long-winded now? Now there's you, there's Catherine, there's Sue, there's me and involved. David. And, and, and David. And David. But yeah, it all came, started from David telling <laughs> you in the first place, I gather. Yeah. So, so now... Lincoln who told Phil the first. Wow. Yeah. wow. <laughs> now there's five people involved in a simple one, like one minute phone call. It, it, it just was the most... Saying, can I come? <laughs> yes, no. It was just a fabulous law of attraction because you talked to me about, well, to us about this the day before. And yeah. Obviously, I didn't get it because no. I just behaved in my normal straight way. Straight away, we go into the straight yeah. away. Yeah. And in each case, we go into this straight away. Yeah. Like if I, if I was David saying to you, um, you know, there's a thing on Saturday, you go. And then you said, no, why don't you give him a ring? Find out. But then go. <laughs> That's what I'd say. Yeah. Right? But, but already you're in the feeling and it's already going. And then, mm. then Catherine's in the feeling and Sue's in the feeling. Then she's at me about it. And I'm going, what? <laughs> it's got nothing to do with me. <laughs> like, you can, I'm okay with anybody coming. It's fine. <laughs> Particularly someone who wants to come. <laughs> yeah. There are plenty who probably don't, don't want to come, but I'm happy if someone wants to. No, right. it's just a wonderful law. Of, it, it really um, showed me completely how I behave. Yes, what That's happens fine. is the... Is the Emotion becomes the God. It becomes the thing that you're only concerned about in the moment. Yeah. right? And by doing that, we've now invested in the emotion rather than actually let it pass through us, like, rather than just let it go. Right? When we let it go, we then will choose the simplest course of action available to us. That's the beauty of it. Like You become so logical after you've let the emotion go. Before then, it's a mess emotionally and logically. right? But, but after then... Once you've connected emotionally to the situation and let it go, you do the most logical thing at that moment. So the most logical thing then would have been straight away ring one of the lit engines up. Can I come? Yes, no. Okay. If it's no, feel some more rejection. If it's yes, you know, if it's no, if you had dealt with all your emotion, you would actually ask why. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be afraid of knowing the reason why. Does that make sense? And, and, and it might have been just a simple matter of, oh, oh we forgot, or oh, we didn't realise you were in town, or, or AJ didn't want you to come, <laughs> or whatever, whatever the answer is, right? And then you would go through that emotion and allow that to pass as well. Does that make sense? And it actually makes your life much more simple. Yeah. You, you imagine with this thing of how much time was taken in this process now. 
It's pathetic. <laughs> I, I just couldn't believe... Well, it's not pathetic because it was all I... done to, f to trigger an emotion yeah. that none of you actually felt. <laughs> yeah, I just couldn't believe the panic. So we've got incredible. person number one doesn't want to feel rejection. Person number two doesn't want to feel like... doesn't want to just feel her feelings of guilt about being responsible. Person number three doesn't want to feel her feelings of guilt either about feeling responsible. So he passes on to person number four who just feels he has no involvement whatsoever about <laughs> the issue. But, but can you see that all of that happens for a good law of attraction reason in that, in that if you were all focused on growing emotionally, you would have treated it as a wonderful opportunity to get into some pretty hard emotions because they triggered some pretty hard emotions, do you see? And, and this is the thing, if we had the focus of, I am growing emotionally here. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to feel this emotion that I feel, which is rejection. And after you felt it, then you would have taken some action that would have been the most logical course of action. And it, it would have been all lined out within a minute. Does that make sense? Could we just go back to Catherine for a minute? Sure. Is that okay, Catherine? Yeah. Because yeah. I feel like... Um, I'm still blaming myself. Yes. You are, You're yeah. if, which if is you your preferred option. Yes. Yeah. You're blaming yourself and it's your preferred option. So rather than feeling what, what really came up for you in this interaction, now you're feeling worse about it than Philippa and Lincoln and That's right. D David and Susan all put together. Yeah. You're yes. feeling like... You, and really, it was an emotion that was triggered when Philippa made the phone call to you that, that you avoided that caused you to call Susan. Yeah. And that's the emotion to focus on. And it's almost the reverse of the emotion that you're feeling. Well, I know I'm feeling the wrong emotion, but mm -hmm. it just... Yeah. It's when you say you're feeling the wrong emotion, let's talk about this more, shall we? Yes. <coughs> we do, in an effort to control one emotion, substitute it with another. Right. So we feel more comfortable. Oh, I'll just go to this comfortable place where nothing's really leaving me, like you identified yeah. at the start of your question. It hasn't been very comfortable. I'm yes. Sure. <laughs> but it is more comfortable, than Catherine, the other emotion. than the other emotion. So you actually prefer the emotion you're in to the one that was really triggered. Can I show you what the other emotion is? Thank you. Okay. So the reason why we substitute is really important for you to understand. We choose substitutions because that's what we were taught to do by our parents. Yes. Okay? So yeah. the question you need to ask yourself then is, when I become self-punishing, what emotion am I substituting the self-punishment for? Right. So this is how your mind can help you find the other emotion. Right? You were taught to substitute self-punishment. Yes. By a parent. Yes. It was all my fault, yes. Correct, right? So what's the real feeling you needed to feel? Whose fault was it that, that, that um, Philippa rang you? Well, it wasn't mine. Correct. <laughs> it was Philippa's fault. <laughs> it was her decision, right? Whose fault was it when things happened to you as a child? It was always my fault. No, it wasn't. No, Whose no was, was it? Blamed. I was, my mother you were blamed, my yes. My mother and my father. Correct. Mother. And you don't want to feel that. You don't want to feel it was Philippa's fault. Right. So Thank I you. I actually feel there's two things here. You don't want to feel it was Philippa's fault. You also don't want to feel how you felt about how you perceived Philippa was being treated. Yeah. So can you see in your childhood you... You were taught to blame yourself rather than feel the truth of how you were treated. Yes. And then when Philippa tells you a story where you feel like, oh, that's not fair. Yes. There's emo many emotions in you where you feel the way, the way you were treated were, was not fair. No. Well, no but you don't want to feel them, so you're quickly acting to, to stop the injustice. Yes. The perceived injustice. Yes. Instead of going, okay, my sister's called me. Oh, oh, that doesn't feel good, what I'm feeling about that. That doesn't feel good. That could lead you into, yeah, as a matter of fact, I feel like lots of people get overlooked in life. And actually, when I really feel about it, I was completely overlooked in my childhood. Yes. And that's the grief you don't want to feel because that's the most painful. 
Thank so you. you prefer self so you prefer self punishment. To that one. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And and if you know if if Philippa had rang myself, I wouldn't punish myself for Philippa ringing me. No. I'd go, Philippa, why don't you ring the Lytton Hitchens and find out? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Just a simple thing. And I wouldn't assume the Lytton Hitchens did the wrong thing. I wouldn't assume they did something that was unjust. I wouldn't assume that either. Those assumptions only come from the fact that in your childhood there was a lot of unjust things that happened and so there is the presumption inside of you that most things that happen are unjust. Does that make sense? So it creates the filter where you start to see the world you see full the world. of potential injustice. Yeah. yeah. Does, that, does everyone see that? Yeah, yeah. So it's very important to understand that we choose all sorts of techniques to avoid the actual emotion. And most of those techniques that we choose were techniques that we were taught to choose. Does that make sense? So, so that's why we're good at it, because we were taught it over many years. Right from an early age of childhood, we were taught how to do that. So, so, for example, one very common thing that happens in a family, when you don't get what you want from one parent, what do you do? You go to the other one. And because they don't communicate very well, generally you get your own way. Right? Isn't that not true? So when we're an adult, when we don't get what we want, what do we do? Go to someone else. We'll get what we want from them. Like it's an automatic response. It's something we don't even consider or think about because we were taught to do it from bang. From the time we were born, we did it. You know, In my family, if you had an issue that you had to raise with Dad about wanting to do something, you got your sister to do it. Because Dad had a bit of a favouritism towards sister. and Her name's Jenny. And, and so, you know, if Jenny went and asked Dad, usually it happened. <laughs> right? But Mum and Jenny... My mum's my name's Maxine. She, they didn't get along so well all the time. Jenny would often steal her clothes or whatever else, you know, and use them and whatever. So not so good there. If you wanted to talk to something about mum, then you come to Johnny, <laughs> which is me, right? AJ, Alan, John, Miller. They used to call me John. So you come to John, and he has to sort that out with mum. <laughs> right, then something will happen there. And this is how most families work, isn't it? There's a favourite child, a favourite child by both parents, have an, usually even a different favourite child. You go to that favourite child if you're another one of the siblings and that's how you get a bit of things that you couldn't get before. And then you go between mum and dad because if you go between mum and dad, one of them will feel guilty, surely, at the end of the day, <laughs> and you'll get what you want. And then, and then also, if that doesn't work, then go to grandma and grandpa if they're alive. You know, they have control over mum and dad most of the time, so you probably get something what you want from them. And if that doesn't work, what you do is you complain about it at school with the teacher and she raises it with the parents and then everything gets real complicated and so forth and so forth. And, you know, what we try, <laughs> not very loving the whole process, of course, but what we try, we've been taught to try because there's a general inconsistency across the board with the way everything, everybody does things and says things and how they feel. They've all got their own emotions they haven't healed and as a result, they're going to re re respond individually to the same situation differently. And that's, no one's at one with God yet. No one's at one with God. If you were at one with God, you'd probably respond to the same situation in the same way, right, as God would. And if we were all at one with God, we would all probably respond to that situation very similarly if it was in a situation that was out of harmony with love. But that's not how we were brought up, right? And this is where you've got to be careful with judgment because many of us have taught, been taught a lot of things about what we should do Way before we had any intellectual development, by the time we were seven years of age, it was well established what we should do. Right? Well established. And, and most families are completely unaware of these well established rules and methods of control and getting what you want, but now we live them the rest of our lives. You know, that's the issue. And rather than judging that, we need to just examine, is that loving? Not loving? No, it's not loving. Let's go ahead and work through our issues to get it so that it's loving now. That's all we need to do. Yeah? Vanessa, did you want to ask a question? Vanessa? I'm just wondering, Mary, um, in a talk quite a while ago, you were talking about um, almost riding the emotion because I have a compulsion to act. 
Yep. So you were saying it's not sitting in the motion but allowing the full extent of the emotion before you act. I was talking about desire, wasn't I? Desire, I was yeah, but I was thinking maybe it applies to everything. Well, and when I was talking about desire, I was talking about the fact that we get a little bit of desire and then we get afraid and then we quickly act to try and just prevent the level yeah. of... And sometimes we act in a pos like towards the desire, if you like, or sometimes we act away from the desire, but in both ways, we're not allowing the f ourselves to feel the full amount of desire that we have for that thing before we start to embrace it. When we, when we allow that, I feel we naturally move towards embracing it. So it's not like, allow the full amount and now I'll mm. act. Yeah, I just want to comment. To me, that sounds all intellectual. <laughs> you know, like, like the reality is if you fully express an emotion, you will instantly act on the emotion. But there is a difference, isn't there, between acting to suppress the emotion or acting... You will act in harmony with the yeah, emotion. But you just need to make sure that you, you are feeling as, uh, to the full extent. No, see, that now is involving your intellect, and of course you're asking that question because that's how you do things, but, you know, it's, again, not how you do things when you're fully emotional. When you're fully emotional, it's like, how I have a feeling, I act on it straight away. It's not like I'm going to consider, consider it even. Now, the only consideration I ask myself is, is this loving? But you don't even have to ask that after a while because you know it is, right? So you don't even ask that. You just feel it, act straight away. It's not like... I want to give Mary a hug. What am I going to do? Go, feel that feeling, feel that desire rise. Yes, that's a nice desire. Now I'll just check with Mary and make sure that she's okay with all that. Yes. And now I give it, oh, she's maybe not okay with that. Oh, now, you know, honestly, by the time we've done all that, if you're really feeling the emotion, the emotion's probably passed. But you're not even <laughs> like, feeling the emotion in that action, are no, you? You're, you're no. in your intellect you're and in your fear. Intellect. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to explain about Correct. desire, is when you, yeah. you allow it properly. Yeah. It's, and it is the same for all emotion. But you have to be careful about setting up a rule of going, I can't act until I've had this emotion to the full extent. Because that's about your will. And if you're having to push yourself... Either direction. In either direction, <laughs> your will's already not engaged to feel the emotion to the full extent. So, like, mm. Philippa acting, her will was already like, I don't want to feel that. And so that created the action. You're better off to acknowledge to yourself, I don't, I don't want to feel this. I feel rejected. I, I feel rejected and I don't want to feel it. That would be a more yeah. powerful place because yeah. at least you're acknowledging what the real problem is. And when you go to take an action, just ask the, the question. Prob the problem with ringing another person or phoning another person or going and talking to another person is really what you're starting to do is blaming them for the problem. You're starting to engage the other person in the problem. You're not sort of seeing it as a feeling inside of yourself. And so you start engaging other people in your problem. And people do it in the world do this all the time. You know, that's what gossipers are good at as well, isn't it? They're engaging everybody in the problem. You know, politicians are great at it. Engage 50% of people in the problem. That's how they get elected. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that true, though? You, know, you, you don't hear don't very many positive things yeah. being shared where they go, oh, I'm going to get elected on this real positive, like... <laughs> no, engage 50% the, of the voters in the problem and you'll get elected because they'll all agree with you. And so it's not about solving problems, it's about actually just engaging the emotions of people in the problem. You know, to be frank with you, like if I wanted to be a politician in Australia, I could get, a, I could get elected next... If I was willing to compromise a lot of principles, I could get elected next election. Because once you know the emotions of everyone, you know how to manipulate them. And if you had an unloving feeling in you, you could manipulate them. And once you manipulate people's emotions, you can pretty much get anything you want. It's not very loving, of course. So you wouldn't do it, right? If you really loved, you wouldn't do it. Hmm. Okay, Eloisa? Remember we're talking here about the proper understanding of emotion now. We're trying to understand emotion. That's our primary goal. And we don't want to get too much off doing that, but let's... Yeah. let's no, because this, yeah. this is off topic. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's try to get back to the topic, shall we? Because it, it's really important that we have the proper understanding of emotion. Now, what have we basically said? The proper understanding of emotion is that emotions 
pass. So they are not important to hold on to. They are important to feel and let them pass. This is a big difference. When you, when you feel they're important to hold on to, now you're investing in them and now you'll do anything to protect them. And that's not good. It's not a good thing for you. You're going to do a lot of very unloving things doing that. When you let them pass, they pass. You don't have to act upon them even if they're negative. Don't even have to act on them because you're just feeling them. When I say act upon them, I mean if you feel anger, you'll go out and punch something, but you won't punch a person or you, know, you won't kill a live thing or anything like that if you're fully in harmony with love while you're feeling the emotion of anger. Do you, do you get that? So, so that you'd fully express the emotion, but you wouldn't take further damaging actions about the emotion if it's unloving. And that's all about fully feeling the emotion, letting it pass, letting it through you, let it through you. Let yourself feel it. Really let yourself feel it. Don't, don't hold back with the feeling of it. Like Sometimes we have discussions with people and they come around and we go, and, and we have a long discussion about what one of, their, you know, one of their sadnesses or one of their griefs are about. And we get to the point where they're just about to cry. What are they doing? <laughs> get that back down again, right? And get it under control. And now that entire conversation of two hours was just a waste of time. Right? There might have been two, three, four, five, six people involved in it. It's all just a waste of time now. Because the actual emotion that was, it, was uncovered during the discussion never got felt. If you chose to feel it in the moment, you would have just run off, have a big ball, you know, carry on for, you know, it's just a feeling of grief for maybe an hour, a couple of hours. And sure, everyone else might have gone home <laughs> during that time. But the conversation would have had an end result, a purpose. And that is to help a person get to an emotion and let it pass through them. Much better choice. Isn't it? Okay, so uh, Laura, and what's on my list, baby? Just Honey, we just haven't done that. We haven't done this, yes. We need to do that. that. Um, I do understand when you just said that um, it was a waste of time because it was ripe in that moment, but because of that, um, the body actually knew what, what was coming up. Does it also create um, an opportunity for that emotion to be felt or those circumstances then have to...? No, actually the person had to put up a stronger barrier in order to not feel the emotion, so it actually made the situation worse for the person. And this is why you don't realise, every time you're shutting down an emotion in a situation, you're making it harder to access the next time it comes around. So when we don't want to cry in public, mm -hmm. um, especially in the settings when we, where you guys, mm -hmm. where, you know, to get, to get through that cap would be really beneficial, especially if we're doing mm -hmm. assistance groups and we're going to... Yep. You know, be around that so much. Definitely. Just, you just, all you have to do is walk out the door and have a book prior, come back in. You don't want to interrupt other people from having the session, right? So you just leave and have a good cry and come back. And, and the reason why a lot of us don't do that is because we're going to think, we think we're going to miss out, which is another emotion. We think that somebody is going to condemn us for it. Judgment, another emotion. Or, <laughs> yeah. I'll, go, I'll do that later when I get I'll do that home. later, which is a bit of a furphy. Usually that's because we don't want to do it now, right? And so that's another emotion. <laughs> and really there's a whole series of emotions that stop us from doing that generally. And we need to allow ourselves to feel those too if we're ever going to become a fully 100% emotional being. And, and can you see how like, we compound the problem by a level, a level of resistance? If an emotion is getting exposed, like let's, say, let's say behind this wall, remember the wall is fear, right? Behind the wall is the emotion you have to feel. Right? The one that's going to heal you is right there, just straight behind the wall. And the wall is generally fear right, of something. Be specific. It's not just a generalised fear. It's a fear in particular of this emotion, is it not? In front of the wall is the addictions. And you're here. What are you going to have to do? <laughs> if a feeling is on a feeling, an emotion is about becoming 100% emotionally, what are you going to have to do? If you want to... This is the healing emotion here, this one. 
that heals you. I heal when I feel that. What am I going to have to do? Eloisa, just help me through the process. I'm going to have to go <sighs> through these addictions. I'm going to have to feel... You're going to have to feel them. The to addictions. Correct. How much I want them. What happens when I feel them? They're going to get bombed out of there. Oh, and then I'm face to face with my wall. So I'm here now. <laughs> then I'm going to have to feel through my fear. Correct. All right. What does feeling my fear do? Eliminates my wall of fear. All right. So now I'm there. And then I reckon you're probably not going to have much problem in actually <laughs> feeling, feeling the, the emotion. emotion. Exactly. And when I feel that emotion, my body heals, my, my love internally that I, have can, that I can reflect grows, and then, I, then I'm in business, right? I, I've gone through that emotion. Right? And so that then, now that I'm healed, I've no longer got that emotion in me, and it's no longer affecting the rest of my life. It's no longer governing my decisions, it's no longer determining my thoughts, it's no longer determining how I interact with every person around me. It stopped, it, all of that stopped. Does that make sense? All gone. When I take those steps. Now, what the majority of us want to do is this. Here's our wall. That's fear. Here's our healing emotion that we need to feel. Here's our addiction. This is our grief usually, isn't it? Uh, shame, whatever it is. And here's us. What do we want to do? You tell me, Philippa, what you want to do. <laughs> what do you want to do with it? Either not feel it at all or bypass it. Correct. Like, like here's the after, being after, all of that. What do we want to do? Somehow... I don't know how you're going to do it, to be honest. But somehow you want to get from there across to there by somehow digging a tunnel and getting under the whole lot. Yeah. By somehow avoiding all of that process from an emotional perspective. Right? And you know one way that most New Age people have experimented with to get from there to there? It's a really, really easy way that most people have used. They tell themselves they're already there. <laughs> That's what they do. And of course, it's not real. It's completely unreal. But they tell themselves they're already there. They're already over the addictions. They don't have any fear. They don't have any grief to feel anymore. It's all gone. Isn't it wonderful? We're in a wonderful world. It's so lovely. <laughs> and the reality is everything they do is coloured by the emotions that are still within. So it's all fake. It's all not real. But that's what the majority of people try to do. We tell ourselves we haven't got it. We tell ourselves we don't need to do it. We tell ourselves that we shouldn't do it. We tell ourselves that if we do it, something bad's going to happen. And we have like, we'll come up with a hundred different explanations if we have to. Right? And what I'm suggesting, if you want to be a hundred percent emotional being, you won't choose to do that. You won't choose to avoid anything. You won't choose to try to get there using some unknown method that hasn't been created by anyone, including God. You will... Do the method that God created, which is feel the addiction, feel the fear, feel the grief. You will go through the emotional process. You will choose to because you want to. That's what you'll do. Right? The majority of us don't do that right, really. What we do is we try to circumvent it. We work out how to do it. We discuss it with somebody else. Do you know how to get around this addiction somehow? Do you know how to get over this fear somehow without actually going through it? Do you know how to feel to get rid of this grief. Is there some magical solution? Can I, uh, you know, and this is why we're addicted to magical solutions, you know. Ah, oh, there's a potion that gets me through all of that. I'll take the potion. You know, there's a pill that I can take called antidepressant. I take that, get over all that, right? We do whatever we can do physically to avoid the process. We do whatever we can do emotionally to avoid the process. We do whatever we do sexually to avoid the process. We engage all of these ways and means of controlling the process. Yep. When all we've got to do is choose to be a 100% emotional being and go through the process. Like, sometimes I look at what people do in their lives and I go, yeah, wow, if my life was that complicated, I don't know what I would do. Like, 
like I know I'd get rid of the complication. That's what I'd be focused on first, you know. But I, su- I just look at some people's lives and go, wow, how complicated can you make your life? Like turn something that's so simple into something that's so hard and complicated and difficult and, and, and then you, you're dealing with the compensatory effects of all of that as well. Like every unloving choice that's made in that space has to be dealt with, has to be felt and it's just like making a mountain sometimes out of a molehill with regard to our emotions because we believe the molehill is a mountain before we begin. And it's only a belief, you see, if we had the right, proper understanding of emotion, we wouldn't believe the mountain is a molehill or the molehill is a mountain. We would say, a mountain's a mountain and a molehill's a molehill. <laughs> it's just an emotion, every one of them that we can feel. So some of our emotions are large, but it's just an emotion we can feel. And some of our emotions are very small and we turn them into making them large. That's not very honest, but it's also just an emotion we can feel. That's it. Now, there's many other things we'd like to mention to you in this section. So, what's the next one, baby? Okay. We were discussing a yep. while back what happens when we have the wrong atti- We have an improper understanding of emotions. So, this was the wrong attitude towards emotions, right? Yep. And one and of the things we said is that we invest in it. And now, do you understand what I mean by investing in it? Yep. Basically, what, you d- what, what we've just explained is all about the investment. Uh, when you feel that it's just an emotion, you don't feel that investment in any emotion. So you allow each one to flow. You're not spending all half of your life trying to prevent it from flowing. Yep. Good day. So what's next? Okay, there's a few good ones here. That Would you guys like to keep contributing? Things that we do? Well, you're all out. You guys have been doing it. Yeah. What do you reckon, Fab? About the, the wrong wait attitude. For the mic. Yep. Wait for the mic. So. What, things, what things do you tend to do? As the wrong attitude? Yeah. When you have the wrong attitude, what happens? What do you do? What Be- have you been doing? Busy myself. <laughs> Busy yourself, yes. But what's Is that? Is that what you mean? Yeah, um, that's some of the things. Um, yeah. I distract, yeah. Distract. Yes. Yep. I suppose what we're thinking is a bit deeper than that. Broader broader than that, but yeah. How about this one? If we give you some clues. Yes. We identify with the emotion. Do you know what I mean by that? If we pass it the mic to Eloisa. What do we mean by identify, do you think? Um, I think it's that I make it me, like I am bad. I am my fear. Yes. Yes. Like I am. I it feel this, therefore I am yucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and, th- and that's all I am. So, right? what is the proper attitude? Um, that I'm the pinnacle of God's creation and the truth of what that is. True, and but in the fear. moment that you're feeling fear, you are fear, aren't you? No, I'm not just feeling the fear that was put into me. Yes, but in that moment, if it's the feeling you're truly feeling, that's all you'll feel. Okay. So, in the moment, you are fear, but you're not fear. Do you understand? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So if I'm feeling the emotion, then yes, I'm fear in the moment. But what I'm doing when I identify with it is I'm saying I'm fear all the time. And Cor- therefore I'm not feeling it. <laughs> yeah. There's a because difference between the that, permanent, yeah. the belief, yes. and the temporary state. Yeah, and you see, I haven't felt the temp that well. Yeah, I'm not sure I've really <laughs> done the temp. A person yet. who um, has a wrong attitude towards emotion believes it is a permanent yeah. thing, not a temporary state. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Okay. Good. That's so good. that's what we mean by identifying. We identify, what we do is we make it a permanent condition inside of ourselves rather than just a temporary state, a belief that we have a, we're in a temporary state of feeling <laughs> terrified. Yeah. Yep. It's not going to last the rest of our lives. It's impossible, actually, to last the rest of our lives if we allow it to flow through. Flow through. But if we don't allow it to flow through... It ends up permanent. Of course. It's actually, because we have the uh, wrong attitude that it is permanent, it ends up being permanent yep. due to our <laughs> attitude. Yeah. Not because of the emotion itself, but because of our resistance to feeling it. Yep. Isn't that ironic? The very thing we're afraid of we becomes the truth because we're not letting the emotion pass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Paige? Paige? Is that why a lot of women, and myself included in this, 
um, never feel their anger and their rage. Yeah, because uh, you're afraid it's going to be a permanent condition. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, well, I won't even go there. Yeah. yeah. Mind you, all I feel from you is anger and rage. If I'm a male in your company, that's all I feel. Yeah. Yeah. So, so while at times you have permanent. gentle... Yeah, it feels yeah. permanent to me yeah. until you allow the emotion to pass through you, right? Yeah. It feels like yeah. I'm just going to get a barrage. Of, I'm a male, so I'm already, yeah. I'm already bad and wrong and whatever. Yeah. You think about yeah. the recent uh, experience you had on the, uh, with the bookings. You had a man say to you, this is a very, very lovely man actually, he says to you, I'm willing to pay whatever it takes and you can put me wherever you want to. Right? And I go, yeah, that's a really lovely man, you know. Basically, I can shove him anywhere. This is wonderful. What did you feel? That was in there, but yeah. then after that was, he's making me choose for him. Yes. So you thought it was a, he, a you got all gut set going, yes, his exactly. flexibility. He's imposing on my life now. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying, how's he imposing on your life? He just gave you the ultimate stuff. freedom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, exactly. But this is how the emotion inside yeah. of you with your dad and stuff causes you to believe now yeah. some, a male's imposing on your life when he was giving you ultimate freedom. Yeah, and I don't see it. Yeah. I don't see the, the gentle people. I yeah. assume they're all the same. And because you've, you've identified permanently with this emotion, yeah. every man you have an interaction with is a mongrel who's just imposing on your freedom. Yeah. And if it's not clear yeah. now, you've got to watch for it. Yeah. Sooner or later it will come. Yeah. You watch. <laughs> yeah. That's the feeling <laughs> yeah. I have. Yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. with women, you're much more... Yeah, like, we had know. another lady who emails you a, a deposit and doesn't give you any way of finding where she put her deposit. What an unloving thing to do. And you go, no worries, I'll check in the room. Blah, 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 no problem there. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going, oh, if it was me... I probably would have rang them up and said, until you can learn to be loving, you're not coming to the event. <laughs> until you can find... You know, him, Mary emailed her and she says... Uh, and Mary said, look, you were very unloving there because you didn't read any of the instructions. The lady emailed back and said, yeah, I didn't either. You know what my next course of action would have been? And I'm not going to book you in the event either. <laughs> not out of, out of resentment, but, but she's just being unloving and she just admitted it and she has no desire to change. And what's the purpose of the event? To change. to change your own loving condition. And she can't even do the booking in a loving way yeah. for the event that's going to teach her how to be a loving person. That doesn't make much sense. Like, don't come then. If, 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 if you've got that poor uh, feeling about even doing the booking, then why would you even want to come to the event under those circumstances? Yeah. Tell her that. And she, if she went off and had a cry and then a, uh, went through a process of repentance, then you can say, no worries, I'll put you back on. <laughs> Do you see? Mm. But we don't do that. You didn't do that because women are allowed to get away with murder. Yeah. Aren't they? Because mm -hmm. yeah. they're women. And if I did, <laughs> then I was afraid of their rage too. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. There's some fear involved too. It's not quite as simple sometimes. No. Okay. Okay. Another thing? What about fear? <laughs> How, what would your attitude be to, well, let's just say you'd fear your emotions, wouldn't you? If you had the wrong attitude, you'd go, I can't do it, I'm terrified of it, rather than recognising this is just something I'm going to feel, it'll pass through me, and I'm not afraid of it. Yeah. Uh, how many times I hear that? Man, I say, you've got this, I can't feel that, I can't feel it. Not, not, it's not, she's not saying, I can't. Really what they're saying is, I won't. Or even more right. specifically, I refuse to is really what you're saying. Now, a person with the right understanding of emotions wouldn't say, I'm refusing to deal with every emotion that comes along, would they? <laughs> if you were 100% committed to being a 100% emotional self, that is completely the opposite of what you need to do, is it not? <laughs> yeah. So you wouldn't do that. Okay. But how many of us do that? Pretty often. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. No, it's all gone now. It's gone, done. You know? How does it affect our relationships with other people? Eloisa? And their emotions. And their emotions. Um, and our emotions. So how does it affect other people and our emotions? 
our relationships with other people in regards to emotion. So how do we deal with emotion when we're around others, when we have the wrong attitude? You don't feel it. You try and get out of it. You can't... I, I we would do... Yeah, Lincoln? Mm. Um, you, you alter how you feel to suit, to suit them. Yeah. Or, yeah, so rather than... It's not what I've seen most of you doing, though. Yeah, you blame them, most of you, don't you? Anyone's around you and you feel something, it's sort of, sort of their fault, right? Isn't that what you do? Blame others. Yeah, blame the person you're with, because they're easier to blame than your mum and dad. Yeah. Isn't that what we do a lot of the time? No? You don't do that? Okay, so I rub that off. <laughs> that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Do I agree, Lincoln, you do that thing that you just mentioned, though. Sorry? I do agree that Lincoln often does that thing that he mentioned. What was that? With certain people. He alters himself to suit certain people. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. But, yeah. but, it's, but if you look at even that, isn't it sort of almost a passive-aggressive way to just get what you want? Why, why would you alter yourself? Why do you alter yourself? To please them. To please them. Why do you want to please them? To get what to I get, want. To get what we want. Well, what is it that you want? It could be um, the admiration, acknowledgement, yeah. sex. Sex, approval, On it goes. acceptance. Um, so what is it that you're actually avoiding? Feeling the real emotion. Which is, I'm not going to be admired unless I do this. I'm not going to be accepted Wanted. unless I do this. Isn't it? Yeah. So it's a great way to avoid some emotion, but it's a passive-aggressive way of avoiding emotion. You're really, in a way, blaming the other person for the fact that you've changed your life for them. So, in other words, you're lacking the courage to just be yourself and let them have their response. Yeah, in case they don't like me. Yeah, yeah. So you don't want to feel that they don't like you. And so you lack the courage to feel your own emotion. It's not... It's not about them, really. It's about you, you see. This is where it's a passive-aggressive way of blaming someone else. When you change your behaviour, your demeanour, in order to please another person, it's a passive-aggressive way for you to avoid certain emotions inside of yourself about how they may act if you are yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then in the end, when you live with them for a while, you go, I've done this for you. I've done that for you. <laughs> As if... Because you're addicted to what's coming back to you, you see. And that's why we do it. We don't have the courage to actually go, no, I'm going to be myself. And if you're just angry about that, then be angry about that. <laughs> you know, if you don't like me, don't like me. If you don't want to have sex with me, don't have sex with me. If you don't, you know, we don't want to take the consequences of the person's response to us being real. So we wouldn't do that if we were 100% emotionally involved, would we? We'd go, okay, this is not about preventing her response, in your case, her response mostly, or someone else's response to your emotion. It's not about that. She needs to have her emotion and I need to have mine. That's how you would feel if you were 100% like into feeling the emotion. Let, let them have their rage, let them have their sadness, let them have their... Shame, let them have their, you know, whatever it is that they're feeling. Let them have it. Because that's, that's the gift you can give them by allowing them to have an emotion without your judgment and without your investment in them feeling something. Mm. So when we have the wrong attitude to emotions, we're often afraid of other people's emotions. And fear of other people's emotions is really just... Fear of your own emotions. Does that make sense? Because that is really just fear of my own emotions. Because why are we afraid of others' emotions? Because we're afraid of our own response to their emotions. So that's just really fear of my own emotions. Can you see how narcissistic and selfish we are? <laughs> like, uh, like, most of the time we're just... Like, uh, we're trying... Even people sometimes who sit down and explain to somebody, oh, do you see this and do you see that and do you see this? 
a lot of it's self-absorbed because the reality is you're trying to prevent the other person from feeling something so that you don't have to feel something that they're doing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Like, did I say that too fast? You, you notice how I can say things fairly fast <laughs> because I understand these things. Like, <laughs> right? But we are often just so invested in feeling the, uh, the, other, the other person and, and helping the other person not have an emotional response. And we're only doing it for selfish reasons. We're only doing it so that we don't have to feel something if they were to feel something different than they feel. And that, that's, you know, when, you, when you're 100% emotionally engaged, you want the other person to feel everything and you want yourself to feel everything. You don't want any of you to avoid it. Yeah? It's actually quite abusive to do that and then call it, I'm doing this because I just need to be truthful or because I love you to come and tell you something so that you stop doing something that's bothering me. Mm. The only purpose you should have for telling another person something about themselves that they do that's out of harmony with love is so that you can help them to become more loving. Can you see that? If you were a truly loving person... The only motivation you would have is to help them become more loving. You wouldn't have a motivation of having them stop what they're doing to you. You wouldn't have a motivation of making your life easier or better. You wouldn't have any of those motivations. You would, you would just have the one single motivation. I love you and I want to help you get over this problem. That's all you'd feel. Now in most it's relationships that's not what we feel, right? We go... You've got this problem, you've got that problem, you've got this problem, right? And blah, 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 and, and, and the other person saying, you've got this problem, you've got that problem, you've got this problem. You know, sure I've got this problem, but you've got that problem too. And yeah, sure I've got that problem, but you've got this problem too. And the only reason why we're telling each other what problems we both have is so the other person stops their behaviour so I don't have to feel about what they're doing. Which is actually a selfish motivation. And that's why it ends up in an argument in the end. It's a lovely feeling to reach the point of feeling gratitude for truth because the experience that I'm having now is that I feel like, because I feel truth is a gift when I receive it and I have so much gratitude for the truth that I've already received from God and my soulmate, there's a whole new motivation in when I tell truth to others and it's actually a feeling of like, no, this is... You know, if you're open to receive this, I'm going to tell you as much as I can because I know how life-changing it is. And it's actually the thing that motivates me through a lot of fear sometimes because I can see the beauty and the gift of truth. Um, Whereas before, I was very afraid and I sat in the fear because I didn't even really know if truth was... From a soul perspective, it was if it was so great to actually receive truth. But now that I feel so excited about truth, I feel really drawn to whenever there's an opportunity and a sister or a brother is open to to hearing from me, I'll say a truth, even if I might be afraid of how they're going to respond to it. Um, Because it's awesome. (laughs) And I just feel like sometimes, don't you realise that I'm pretty frightened about some of the things that happen? Like, honestly, like, I get asked all sorts of questions... Most people I know, if I respond truthfully, I know what they're going to do beforehand. I can feel the emotion in them. So I feel what the primary motivation is going to be. I feel like they're going to probably do with the truth that I give them. So let's say you knew in advance that someone was going to bop you in the nose if you said a certain thing. What would you do? For most people, they try to not say it, right? They try to say it, or or they say it in a roundabout way so the person doesn't even understand, <laughs> you know, like that. That or they try to tone it down for public consumption or whatever it is, right? I can't do that because I can feel that when I do that, I harm my relationship with God. So what I try to do instead is I try to say exactly what the problem is, no, fully knowing what that person's going to do with the information I've just given them. Like I know when people are just going to go off and. Like there are people who write now, they're, they're dedicated to writing internet sites about me that are just about how bad I am. And I know they're going to do it beforehand. 
I can feel the emotion in them that co would cause them to do it and I know they're going to do it before and, and they've asked me for some truth. What do you do? Well, if you love them, what would you do? You'd give them the truth in the best possible way that you're capable of giving it at the time. That's what you'll do. And you won't be concerned about what they'll do with it. You'll, you'll hope, in fact, that, that even though they have that emotion in them that you can feel, that they might act differently. They have a choice to act differently and you're hoping that their choice will be engaged differently. You empower their choice by doing You empower their choice. They That's what you do. Yeah. You Without knowing them. truth, sometimes they don't even, they're not even aware of the choice to deal with the error or not. And by showing them the error that's there, you give them the choice to make to decide, okay, I could look at that or I might not. But without mm. speaking up, there's no choice. Yeah. And when you withhold giving people truth, you have already made a decision for them that they're not capable of receiving it. So you're basically saying to them that you believe they're not capable of actually receiving that truth. You've made the decision for them. You've taken away their free will, actually, by making the decision for them. All right. And you see it happening all the time in relationships where one party makes a decision for the other party, not from an outward, I'm making a decision for you, Mary, but from the thing of withholding information from the other half. Right? So the other half doesn't have an emotional response of some kind. That's making a decision for the other half to not feel something. You've already made the decision before it began. They don't have it. If you, if, you, if you had the proper understanding of emotion, you'd never do it. Can you see? Because you want the other person to have a full emotional response to the thing they're faced with and to go through it and to experience it and to release it. That's what your desire for them is, even though it might not even be their desire for themselves. That would be your desire for them. So you'd engage that. Any sense? Mm. Okay, what's else on the All list? All right, well, uh, okay. I think we've covered most of those things yes, on the proper we're wrong attitude. Our emotions. Uh, we involve others in feeling our emotions with us. And we yeah, talked about we've that. We've talked about that a bit, haven't we? Involving yep. others. And and that uh, example of your own, Philippa and Catherine, that's a good example of how we involve others. It, you know, it's like a great example of what we do when we don't want to feel our own emotions is we try to tie in everybody else into the emotion, you know, and that way we feel somehow validated by not having to feel our own emotions somehow. Yeah. And it's quite a, a damaging thing to ourselves and others. So we involve others. And also by involving others, as we pointed out, we finish up taking a long time to do something when it could have been just a little time to do something when it comes to our emotions, yeah? So we need to see that. So that's our wrong attitude. So let's just, okay, what's the right attitude then? We've already touched on lots of these. We've touched on the rights of them. We've compared already. So you should already have a bit of an idea of what the right attitude is for a lot of these things. Any ideas? Eloisa? <clears throat> fully feel all of your emotions in the moment when they come up. Yes, but what causes you to have the right attitude about that? Oh, I want to love. So, yes, so desire, so a desire to feel, yep. yeah, a desire to love. To the mo most loving thing is for me to feel everything I feel rather than making someone else responsible for what I feel. That's the most loving thing. Yep. Anything else you think of? If we come across to... A desire to know the truth about... Great, yeah, yep. truth, yeah. But what if you have a feeling that you don't want to know? What would you do then? You'd feel yeah. it. I don't want to know the truth. Yeah. It's like yeah. I was thinking before, like how many of us, including me, so I'm, a fear, I, I'm a fear of attack and I placate to fear of attack. It's not the attack that I fear because that's not an emotion. It's my response to, to the that attack, attack that's, that's not permanent. They can attack me for the rest of my life, which is the permanent. Correct. But well, I it's not even permanent either, to be honest. I've been attacked oh, okay. by and murdered by people that now love me. Yeah. So. But I viewed that as that's never going to end as opposed to how I 
feel inside my own skin about that. That's the that's, and that's the, the false belief that you also need to feel. Yeah, mm. but I've got to be open to hearing that before I desire to feel. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Teresa. Um, desire to for clarity and to know what's real. Yeah, but what if you don't desire that? And to feel, work out why, feel why I don't want to know that. Yeah, feel you don't want to know it. Yeah. First, you need to feel you don't want to know. So you see, what I see a lot of people trying to do is they try to feel an emotion that, that is not the real emotion they actually feel. So many times you're trying to feel an emotion that is not the real emotion. So, you know, I've got to develop a desire to feel. No, you've got to develop a desire to see what you really feel right now about feeling. <laughs> you see? Yeah, sorry, it sounds good. Yeah, it sounded right? like it. Is it all gone? gone? I just think for a minute. Um, for a moment. My battery's still good. Battery's still good. Huh? I missed what you said, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah. When you... Like, the, you've got to feel the emotion that's there. Yeah. So if you don't have a desire for the truth, then feel that you don't have a desire for the truth. If you feel you don't have a desire to feel, then feel that you don't have a desire to feel. You don't want to feel. <laughs> I don't want to feel. You know, yeah. feel that. Yeah. Feel, feel the feeling that's there. Stop telling yourself that that's not a good feeling to feel, so I'm going to try to have a desire when the real feeling underneath me is that I don't have one. Does that make sense? So, so this is what I see a lot of people doing with their emotion. They go, here's the real emotion... And I don't want to feel that one. But here's the emotion that I know I should feel. So this is the should. That's what I'll... Then we use the word try to feel. Now, do you know what will happen? Once we feel the real emotion, there is no should or try generally. We don't have to try and we don't have to think about what we should do, we automatically do it. So isn't it pointless doing the should and the try? So, like, do you need to... Do, what's the right attitude to your emotion? Is desire to feel the right attitude to your emotion? Is it? What if the emotion is that you don't want to feel? Yeah, so isn't it more a desire to feel the truth of the emotion rather than just a desire to feel an emotion, developing a desire to feel an emotion? Because you might not have a desire to feel emotion. In fact, the very thing you might feel is that I have no desire to feel emotion. I don't want to feel any emotion. I'm sick and tired of being told I have to feel some emotion. I don't want to get closer to God. I'm tired of the idea that I have to get closer to God. I don't want to hear this anymore. Can I please walk out of this room? Thank you. <laughs> Yes, and that's what you want to feel. Does that make sense? So feel it. That, see, when you feel it, it gets out of you. Without feeling it, it stays in you, and you're trying to be here when you're not really here. Do you see that? And this is where most of us make the mistake. We look at all the things we should be doing, right? and the right attitude to emotion is, no, just feel what's there right now. Be real about what's there right now. Not, not, not the thing you are, hope's there now or the thing that should be there right now because Daddy said so. Oh, no, oh, that's right, it's AJ said so. Stop <laughs> replacing Daddy with AJ. Or God said you should do it, so you should do it. Do you think God's out there going, yes, I said you should do it, so you should do it? No, God's going out there saying, look, I designed you to do it this way, but you can do whatever you want. All right? So even God's not going to punish you for not doing it. And to be honest with you, aren't you already getting punished enough by the law, which is, <laughs> which is the result of you butting your head against the brick wall of God's laws? Uh, doesn't that hurt enough already to get you to stop doing it the wrong way? And if it doesn't, then maybe you need to butt your head against a few more walls first to find out whether that's right or not. Do you see, the right attitude is really feel what is there right now. Be honest about it. Stop trying to tell yourself it's something different than it really is. Because uh, honestly, if you keep doing that, 
you will never get over any emotions because it will just be should try, should try, should try, should try. I've got to try, got to do this. This is the right thing to do, so I have to do it. No, do you want to do it? The only time real change is going to occur in your life is if you want to do it. Right? So if you don't want to do it, feel that you don't want to do it because that will release the feeling that you don't want to. Do, it. Yes. do you get that? Yeah. Right? It will release the feeling you don't want to. And once you've released the feeling you don't want to, then you, who knows underneath that what might be there, you might have a feeling you do want to after that. But you don't know unless you release the feeling that you don't want to. Like, so when something bad happens and you go, I don't want to be loving right now. I want to go and just bop the person in the nose right now. That's what I want to do. Now, you don't have to act upon that, but you can feel that. That's what you want. You go out and feel that and feel the frustration. And after that emotion goes out of you, then you'll feel some of the fear that they triggered. And you go, oh, wow, the reason why I feel that, oh, and then all of a sudden you're afraid, like, oh, maybe they just think I'm bad or whatever it is that you're feeling that you've been trying to prevent through the rage, and you feel that. And then after you feel some of that, it might be a day later, you'll just go cry, 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 because the way mum and dad treated me in that situation was this way, and it just hurt, and... You cry about that and then it's all gone. But it wouldn't have even begun if you didn't honour the first feeling, which is, I didn't want to. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Your mic has just come away from your face, so I'm just going to put a bit of tape on you. That's why. The it's thing. flopping. Because yeah. I'm too expressive today. It's great. It's so good. Someone's going to have some life. <laughs> <laughs> Is the heat getting to you guys? Pretty warm. Do you have a it's a lovely, a lovely warm afternoon. In South Australia, where I come from, this is a lovely warm afternoon. It's mild. It's mild weather. When I was growing up, I, li I lived in the Riverland in Loxton, in South Australia, and that's better. better. Um, and uh, it was. During, during the summertime, often it would be like 38 to 42 for like two months straight. And, uh, and it was great because we lived on the river. And so we'd just go down straight after school, down the river, like weekend down the river. We spent whole weekend down the river. My father was always quite an adventurous person. So we spent most of our life down the river and just swimming all the time and lots of water things all the time. So it was really quite good. But in our house... We first lived in a, what's called a Nissan hut. Have you ever heard of them? Yeah. Which is like a tin. It's just a curved tin uh, shed, like round, and no insulation or anything. And uh, we initially had dirt floors in two of the rooms, but after a while that got concreted. But, so the way I grew up, and I've still got a photo of it, and I showed Mary when we went there. And, we'd, and, the, and the Nissan hut I lived in is still there, which is pretty remarkable, because it was like 50 years ago. And, and so um, this Nissan hut, you, you imagine 42 outside and there's no windows. There's, there's just two windows and a door at the front. One, a door at one end and two windows at the back. And you imagine how hot it got inside of there. And she was hot inside of there. No breeze, no fans, no air conditioning, no anything. And uh, so after a while you got used to the heat. Hmm. Yeah, and it was so still in the Riverland, like, like it is today here, just still, like that heat that's just still. And, um, and it used to last for, some, like I said, sometimes months like that, just months like that during the hot season. And that's when the stone fruit would all ripen and, and all of that. So you'd have lots of fruit down the river. <laughs> uh, so it was really quite, quite good. But when people say it's hot now... Particularly in Queensland, when people say it's hot, I go, yeah, this is not really hot yet. <laughs> the other day it was hot. We had 42 or 3 the other day, and it was pretty warm. But, uh, yeah, it's just remarkable, isn't it, even how our emotions affect the absorption of our environment. Is what I notice happens for a lot of people, that they're very intolerant of large environmental swings. Mm. Yep. That certain got to keep their environment in a certain level. And that's all about emotion, wanting to keep your environment in a certain, in a certain level. 
in a certain temperature, a certain comfort zone. It's all about all about emotion. Okay, let's go. Okay. We've talked about this one a lot, so I'll just say it. Yeah. We feel that emotions pass through us and don't stay with us. Yep. So it's really important the pass through thing, you know. You feel that you are not sorry, not permanently what you feel. However, you feel what you feel. You, you feel what you feel while you feel it. You yes. feel you are what you feel while you feel so it. So you get that one? You feel what you feel while you feel it. You feel you are what <laughs> you feel. In other words, you yeah. temporarily feel if you're afraid. You temporarily feel that your whole being is afraid. right? But it's a temporary condition, not a permanent state. A person who doesn't want to feel their emotions always believes that a negative emotion is going to finish up being a permanent state. And they use that as an excuse to not feel the emotion. Okay, you feel that having others share your experience actually cheapens your experience. Mm. Can I sort of explain that a bit more? Um, when you fully engage your emotion, it, it's your personal experience and it's really quite powerful and, it, and it's very hard to talk about right? when you fully feel it. Very hard to talk about it because you can't properly explain it to another person in order for them to understand what it felt like. So you, after a while, you, what you start feeling is that talking about your own emotion, aside from a teaching perspective, talking about your own emotion just cheapens your own emotional experience. It doesn't actually assist you in any way. If talking about your emotion helps you get into emotion, then it means you're in addiction. Does that make sense? Yeah. And most people are actually in that addiction. They need somebody to share them the emo with the emotional experience and they say they need someone to talk to about their experience rather than just feeling it. There's a difference between going to a therapist and having them you know, do some body work or something and letting you just feel than, than going to someone to talk to and just talk to about it and then you feel. Right? Because when you talk and then feel... While it might help you initially, there is an addiction involved in it, in that you need somebody to listen. Mm. Mm. And you're unprepared to go through your emotion unless somebody listens. And that is obviously a big addiction. Yep. Right? Mm. Good, eh? Cool. I like this one. Mm -hmm. Don't you like them all? I love them all, <laughs> but this is a <laughs> favourite for this moment. Mm -hmm. Feel, we feel that emotions are open-heartedly welcomed. So they're not just okay. Our heart is saying, yes, please. Emotion. Open-heartedly welcomed. Yeah. Now, it's pretty easy to open-heartedly welcome some positive thing, right? It's a lot more difficult to open heartedly, open heartedly welcome fear or shame or something like that. But after a while, we start feeling that it's like a relief to get to that place. Yeah. And it is a real relief to get to that place properly. And, and it's only people who have not gotten to those places who don't understand how relieving it is. Because mm. it's such a beautiful place to be, to be open hearted to all of your own emotion. Yeah. Of course, if you're open-hearted to your own emotion, you're also open-hearted to everyone else's too, which is, means that you're, you're easy to be around from an emotional perspective. You, you, you allow other people's emotions to flow. And that also makes them more comfortable to feel their emotions when they're in your, your company. Mm. So it has a positive benefit to others too. Mm. We also begin to feel that others are real when they are emotional around us. Mm. So mm. rather than fearing other people being emotional around us, we, we welcome that as well and recognise, wow, that's my brother or sister being themselves. Like if he's angry, that's my brother being angry. <laughs> you know, that's better than him covering over his anger and making out it's not there. Right. You know, even if he's angry with me, it's better than him covering over and making it's not, that not there and he's in total denial. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah. Okay. We feel that when others are emotional, they're being real. I said that one. Feel that emotions need to be in harmony with love in order for a connection with God to be maintained. So in other words, we're not interested so much in feeling emotions that are disharmonious with love. We are more focused on finding the emotion that is harmonious with love. So what I mean by that is that there are times when you have a choice inside of you emotionally to go to one place or another. So, for example, sometimes you could get angry, right? But fear is driving your anger. Right? And if you chose anger, it would only be a manipulation of your environment. It's not a childhood anger, let's say. It's an adult anger where you choose to manipulate your environment with it. Now, a person who's open-hearted with their emotions would choose the fear instead to feel that. Does that make sense? Another problem that many of you have is choosing self-punishment. Now, a person who chooses self-punishment is choosing to avoid a, da a, a deeper emotion that's more painful. Usually it's an emotion where your parents punished you. So it's usually an emotion associated with other people harming you that you don't want to feel because it's so painful. And so what we finish up doing is we <clears throat> go into this state of desiring to punish ourselves rather than have them feel that emotion. And a person who's open-hearted with their emotions wouldn't do that. We would focus more on feeling what the real feeling is, whatever that feeling is. Yep. <clears throat> okay, we feel that emotions out of harmony with love must be experienced to be released, which we've covered a lot about that, haven't yep. we? We've yep. talked about... We've uh, talked about that. Yeah. We feel that growth is impossible without the experience of emotions. So we're not addicted to convincing ourselves that we've already grown when we haven't felt any emotion. You know, we, we have a tendency to do that, right? To try to convince ourselves we're over something before we've even gone through anything. Yeah. You can't be over something unless you've gone through something. Right? And even when we've started to go through it, we hope that we've finished it before we have. <laughs> we wouldn't do that either, right? We would allow... You know, sometimes I hear people say, oh, I thought I was over that. I go, no. What, why does that distress you? Oh, because I cried about that for a month, you know. I thought I was over it. Well, you're going to have to cry for it for two months, obviously. <laughs> you know, if you're open-hearted with your emotions, you, you, you'll just let that happen. You won't go, oh, I've had a month, that's enough now. <laughs> Can you see that? You, you would actually go... No, I'm going to do what is necessary, even if it's six months or 12 months or 18 months or 10 years. I'm going to do what's necessary. You wouldn't have the attitude of, oh, one month, that's enough, one hour. Most of us has got, have got this attitude. 10 minutes, that's enough. <laughs> that's how most of us feel with our emotions, right? But you, to be 100%, like, if you multiply the 10 minutes in a day, man, it starts adding up, doesn't it? Because you, you go... Okay, if we're only emotional for 10 minutes of the day, then how many minutes are there in a day? There's 60 seconds times by... 60 minutes. 60 minutes makes one hour times by... 12. No? 24. Well, it depends how, how awake you are most of the time, I suppose. Isn't it? But really, it's 24, isn't it? So what's that? So it's 3,600 times by 24. That's how many minutes there actually are in the day. Now, let's say we do do it by 12 because we're asleep half the time, right? And we don't know what we're doing in a sleep state. Hopefully, we're making the same choices as we are in our awake state. But let's just go for that. So it's 3,600 by 12, which is what our doable time is around about, or a bit more than that, maybe. That's assuming we sleep 12 hours a day. Probably not. So we might make it by uh, 16, shall we? Most of us would sleep eight hours a day. What's that? 66, What is it? It's a lot of minutes, right? Yeah. Isn't it? Now, if you then get that figure, so let's just get it out. So, oops. That's how many minutes we've got available in the day. 
five, seven, six, oh, oh, and we've used ten of those to fill. Now, would, would you be that happy with that? If, you were so, if somebody said, oh, I've got to come to work for you for a day. And they gave you 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you'd be that happy with that. And the, to, to be honest, the most of us are probably not that happy with that, you know, if we looked at it that way. And yet we convince ourselves that that's good. We did good today. 10 minutes of open-hearted emotional feeling. Compared to 100%, you know, of feeling, we're feeling 1% of the time. Now, we want to improve it from 1% to 2% to 5% to 10%. You know, we want to improve the, the feeling process so that it's all the time. That's what we want to do in the end. And if we are happy with 10, you know, with, with 1% of the time, then it probably demonstrates that we don't have the right attitude to our emotion, doesn't it? Probably proof that we don't. We need to have a good look at why. Mm. So, continuing on. Yeah. We feel that a loving condition is impossible without emotions in harmony with love. Mm. We feel that nothing can change while unloving emotions are maintained within. So, those two really go together. So, do you see, like, if I believe that I can change without actually feeling anything... Then, then from God's perspective, I'm just way off the planet, right? Yep. The only way you can really change is by feeling something. So the key is, okay, let me feel. What, what is it I need to feel? I need to have this open-hearted attitude to the feeling. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. And last one. Yeah. That we feel and honour our own emotional experience. Yeah. So you're not interested in trying to manufacture a facade-based experience. You want to feel and honour whatever is inside of you. That's what you want to do. Yeah. Now, there's a whole heap more that we wanted to cover with you, but we feel that you're all a bit tired yeah, now. Enough. You've had enough probably of the subject today, so we'll probably leave the subject there. And the next time we're down, which probably be six or eight weeks' time, we'll continue on with the rest of the subject. Does that sound all right with you? And in that time, what we would suggest to you is this. Practice getting a stronger emotional connection with yourself. In everything you do, feel what you're doing. Feel a stronger emotional connection with yourself. Be honest about your real emotion about things. Be honest about when you're angry, sad, shamed, when you're frustrated, annoyed. All, the, all these feelings we need to be honest about. Pra practice doing that. You, over the, you've got six weeks, before, eight weeks before we come again. See how you go in that period of time doing those things. Practicing that attitude of getting closer connection with your true emotional self. And be honest about what it feels like. If you're raging, ra you know, let, let some of it out. You know, be honest about it. If if you have been using substitute techniques, try to stop your substitute techniques. You know those techniques that your parents taught you? So the self-punishment technique, try to stop that over the coming months and find what you're substituting that t technique for. What did your parents teach you to do that for? Right? If you find you're involving others in your emotional processing all the time, try to stop that process and just own your own emotion and just let yourself feel what it feels like and how alone you feel and how sad you feel that nobody else knows what you're feeling. Let yourself feel that. Does that make sense? Let yourself go through these feelings that are tough feelings. But let yourself go through them. When you go through them, they'll go out of you. Yeah. So just straight back, thanks, Teresa. Um, with the feeling of numb, um, being numb, mm -hmm. um, is, is, that, is, is that a feeling or it's the refusal to feel? It's a refusal to refusal. feel, yeah. Yeah, refusal to feel. Yeah. So even so, though the, the, the anger's not there, but start with, I know this is the refusal to feel and just getting into that. The, what's feeling. the refusal to feel? What would you define it as an emotion? Anger. Anger. So there's anger you, you, that you need to express and you're passively trying to express it by refusing to feel. You need to actively express it. Let yourself actively express your anger about feelings, about the fact you don't want them, 
about the fact they're all traumatic, about the fact that it was terrible when you were young, when you felt, about the, what are your beliefs about that? Let yourself feel them. Let yourself feel that. If, if you feel you're going to get hurt, punished, victimised, abused, violently hurt, whatever it is, whatever it is that happened in your childhood, let yourself feel that. So basically, like in the whole day, if we're going through a, an hour and we didn't feel anything, we're numb. We're numb, yeah. And the key is to find out why. Because we would be feeling either gratitude or we'd be feeling pleasure, we'd be feeling... We'd be feeling... Sad, happy, whatever, you'll be feeling something. You see, when you're 100% feeling being, you're feeling something every moment. Even washing the dishes, like all Even the chores we do Even washing the dishes, do doing the, you know, gardening, you know, cooking a meal, um, you know, laying in bed by yourself, laying in bed with your partner, having sex, whatever it is that you're doing, you're feeling something, right? There's, there's a feeling... If you're 100% feeling being, there, there would be a feeling associated with everything you do, right? And, and so if you're not feeling anything in, every, in what you're doing, then feel why. What it, what it is, why, don't you want, why do you want to feel what you're feeling? Why, why don't you want to feel what's going on right now? Does that make sense? Make, allow yourself to do that. Yeah. And... and it doesn't take a long time to break through if you really desire it, you know, if you really want it. It doesn't take a long time to break through. It, it, it's very, like, for me, I think, to get from the place of just being numb, which I pretty much was when I started, um, to actually feeling every day, it probably took three months. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it wasn't that hard, actually. Um, to, to, to switch from one to the other. Mm. But you have to want it, you know. Yeah, that sounds exciting. And I had to exciting. remove myself from all the people who judged it. Yeah. And I had to create a space for myself where I could do it in that time. And uh, I had to allow myself to go through the process of doing it, even though my family and my friends had judged it. And so you, 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 even that will confront a lot of things for yourself, right? Yeah. Um, and if you live with a partner, then you have to deal with whatever their emotions are about you doing it. Um, but it doesn't have to take a long time to get from that place, you know, from the numb place to the place where you are totally willing to to actually deal with everything. Yeah. So my my feelings are, if we do that, then we'll have made some progress. Mm. Yeah. And the more people who make progress like that, the easier it is for the next generation of people to make that kind of progress. So once you've unblocked the numbness from yourself, your children are going to find it much, much easier to, to be connected with themselves emotionally 100% of the time. And it will get to be that way that they won't even have to go through this process of going, what am I feeling now? Like, why am I so numb? Because they'll never be numb. They'll never even get into that state in the first place. And that would be a wonderful gift we can give the next generations of people, to give them that gift where every child that is ever born never has to go through this feeling of getting back out, getting out of a numb state and into a feeling state. Yeah. You, you think of uh, the trauma that you've had to... Like, the divine truth that you have heard has been joyful to hear, has it not? But very hard to practice. A child... Uh, who really wants to hear this divine truth would find it a joy to hear and not hard to practice. And wouldn't that be wonderful? That every person who ever hears divine truth doesn't find it hard to practice. Right? At the moment, every person who hears divine truth is like, ah, oh, no. Like, what have I got to do with this <laughs> now? Like, and then we'd see ourselves and we go, oh, no. Like, it's even worse, isn't it? Because you... Oh, there's all these things I now see, and who knows what it is that I don't see. That's even worse. Like, you're telling me there's even things I don't see too. And, and we just feel overwhelmed with the, with the job of getting back this connection, this 100% connection, right? And that is a direct result of how long humanity has been in this state. This state where they believe the intellect is the dominant thing, the emotion is subservient, and um, the state where we've tuned out of being 100% emotional beings all the time. Yeah. Would it be true to say then that, because um, I'm just saying your take on feeling overwhelmed, that 
it's a beautiful process because it deals with so many different emotions. Like they're just simultaneously Correct. kind of just happening. So it's a beautiful Yeah. And being process. overwhelmed has one great advantage. You know what that is? Every time you're overwhelmed, your soul expanded. And you've got to remember that, that this is all about this process towards God. Even once you become at one with God, you'll continue to expand. Your soul will continue to expand. Every time you allow the overwhelmed emotions, your soul expands. So, so when, when many of you are going, I'm feeling overwhelmed now, I'm feeling overwhelmed now, don't do this anymore, don't say this anymore, you're actually stopping the process of your soul expanding. That doesn't make much sense. I feel that I even get a headache if I'm stopping the overwhelm. Of course, you get headaches, migraines, or, you know, lots of physical problems in your body. All sorts of things will happen as a result once you start shutting down the flow of the emotion. Remember, when the emotion flows in your body, there is no blockage in your body at all in any area. And once that starts to happen, you will feel much better than you've ever felt. Yeah. And the reality is you can be 70 and feel like you're 20. Right? And eventually, if you allow the emotions to keep flowing, you'll actually not only feel like 20, but you'll probably look pretty close to that too. That's the advantage right, of doing all of these things. But no one's ever really experienced that because no one's ever just allowed the flow to occur. Just allow it all to go through you. So there's so many advantages to it. It's very hard to list them all, of course. But... And what we want to do in our next discussion on this subject, because there's an issue... Remember, we, had, we were talking here about the, the way in which we conceive emotion, you know, our belief systems, if you like, about emotion. So what we've been discussing the last two days with you is basically your belief systems about emotion. Right? What we would like to do now is add to that your belief systems about progression. Does that make sense? and confront some of the false beliefs about progression that we have as well. And that's probably what we'll do in our next time with you, is try to talk to you about your current beliefs about progression, and if you were a full emotional being, what would be your actual beliefs about progression? How would you see progression? Yeah, yeah and can I encourage everyone to be really real mm. uh, in our discussions? I know lots of you are more open about sharing and things, but sometimes I feel like you want to talk about the things you've got rather than the things you're still struggling with uh, or ask questions that you feel comfortable about asking in public. And um, I can feel that there's more opportunities if you're willing to just say, yeah, I disagree or I don't get it or uh, I'm really confronted because I don't understand this thing. Um, that's where I feel like you really help yourselves to engage emotionally with mm. what we present. Mm. We love our discussions with Eloisa, actually. Yes. So, so, Eloisa. <laughs> because, because she's emotionally expressive. She gets enthusiastic when she's enthusiastic. She gets really upset when she's really upset. <laughs> she gets angry when she's angry. And she gets sad when she's sad. And we know exactly where we are in every single moment of the conversation, pretty much. It's so easy. And... And also, there is a deep enthusiasm to learn and, and to be honest about what she feels. So we get to know her during that process. Does that make sense? Many of you are afraid to let yourselves be known and just to be the person you really are and all the feelings that you have and all the thoughts that you have come up during the conversation and just be honest about that. But you don't understand that while you resist doing that, the person who's with you can't know you. They've got to guess you, or if they're sensitive emotionally, they'll feel you, but, but they can't really know you because you're letting them know you. Right? And what we'd like to encourage each of you to do, even with each other, is to let you yourselves be known. Let yourselves know each other and let the other person know you. Let, let them know you, how you feel, what you think, what your thoughts are, why you disagree. When you disagree, why you disagree. Uh, let that happen, that process happen. Because then you can have a true engagement with a person. And when you have a true engagement with a person, the, pro the potential of them progressing is much higher. And this is what any, if anybody who's watching this comes to our assistance groups, that's what we would like to encourage you to do at the assistance groups, is to, to come committed to just being you 
and what you really feel and what you really think and what you, you know, what you really think about what's being presented, not what you, you know, want everybody to believe you feel or think or what you feel is the common feeling in the room, but rather what you really feel and think. Because then we have something to engage with. Right? It's really hard sometimes, often because I'm not talking as much, I'm sort of like super feeling everyone. And sometimes I can feel this huge question in about 80% of the, the audience where they're like, yeah, I don't get it, oh, I don't agree. Or, and nobody's willing to speak up and go... I don't understand. What? What's going on? You know, and sometimes um, in the past, I've gone into the addiction of trying to draw it out of people or prompt my partner to help everyone through that, to that, through that thing. And, and that's why I'm saying now, yeah, we're not going to do that, but you have the opportunity to challenge yourself to be real. Mm. Yeah. And we're happy to um, answer, as you know, questions at any time. And particularly questions on the subject, <laughs> and and like when you're sitting there, got all these questions or all these confusions or whatever, without ex expressing them, then basically all that does is it it causes a number of things. And one of the things we wanted to discuss with you next visit was the amount of spirit influence that occurs under those circumstances, and the amount of spirit influence that occurs in your relationships because you're unwilling to talk to each other properly. Uh, openly and disclose what you really feel. Frank, honest, no. no facade, no, oh, this is the correct way. There's a lot of manipulation from spirits that goes on under those circumstances that causes a lot of trauma in your lives, but it, mostly it occurs because no one's being real about what they really feel, what they really think, what, they, what their real desires are and all those kind of things. So we'd like to talk with you about... We actually had planned to do that today, but we thought we wanted to cover more on this subject of emotions first because without dealing with the emotional things, you can't get rid of spirit influence, right? So uh, unless we have the right understanding of emotion, we can't make the next step of getting rid of the spirit influence. Or, or if you think of spirit influence as the emotions of others imposed upon you. So if you're feeling your own emotions then it's much easier to feel the emotions of those imposed upon you. And you know the difference between yours and theirs. So, you know, this is why the, there is such a... There's such a there are so many subjects, isn't there, babe, about this sort of... that all join together with this relationship with God issue about emotions. And, and that's why it's such a key part of your future development. That's why when we say we're going to give a talk about emotions and relationships and spirit influence, we have to start right <laughs> back here when we sit down to say how we're going to present this yeah. because we feel like there's so much introduction or basic uh, principles that underpin everything. And if we talk about the end thing that we want to get to... We Without fall, the foundation. Yes. Everyone can fall into the trap of thinking they get the foundation when what we're seeing is that a lot of people haven't properly grasped the foundation and yeah. therefore anything we talk about that's an extension of that becomes sullied by that It gets misinterpreted even. Yeah. 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 So when we start talking about spirit influence, it gets misinterpreted. We talk about, you know, the human soul and how it works, it gets, gets misinterpreted. Every, th every subject gets misinterpreted once you are not connected emotionally. It gets misinterpreted through your own filters. So for each individual, it's completely different interpretation. So when you talk together, I, that you go, oh, I got that out of it. The other person says, I didn't get that out of it. I got that out of it. And sometimes what you, two of you got is completely the opposite thing out of it. And the reason why is because no emotional, trans, like no emotional transmission is occurring. We're using words to connect to the, your intellect and what we want to start being able to do with our teaching is to actually use feelings to connect to your emotions. And this is why I encourage you to be really real as audience members. And mm. I'm only encouraging you to do things that I've found have benefited me so much, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for your time again today, yeah. guys. And thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll catch up with you. Uh, we're not sure yet, probably a couple of months. We'll be down. Um, we probably we're, our plan is to try to get down twice before the before the uh, 
assistance group. Assistance group that's ha running in July. Mm. So, but we'll see how we go with that. There's a lot uh, that we wanted to get organised and um, so we'll see how we go. That might only be once, but it'll be definitely once and maybe twice. Mm. Thanks, guys. Thank Look after yourselves, huh? <laughs> <laughs>